Hey, Deborah. Um, we have been talking about dreams so far this week, mm-hmm. and so we declare over you, awake, oh, dreaming ones. Uh, God just may speak to you through a dream. Yes. And as we have uh, reminded you, not every dream's a God dream, but He can speak to you at times through dreams, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, there's 21 recorded dreams in Scripture. Ten of those occur in the book of Genesis, and we've looked at a few of those, and we will again today. And uh, kind of what our focus has been uh, these days is talking about dreams. And again, Acts chapter 2, your young men shall see visions, old men will dream dreams, sons and daughters will prophesy. We're talking about the ministry and presence of the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, it ushered in a new era uh, of, of the prophetic for the Spirit poured out on all flesh. So it's just a a different operation of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament era. It's uh, the Holy Spirit can be poured out on all flesh, not just a select few, but all God's sons and daughters. That's such good news. Yes, it's good news. And that means he can speak to you because you're a sheep and you hear his voice and he knows you. So he wants you to know him more deeply. And he speaks to you through his word, through his spirit, through circumstances, through creation, and a long list of ways. And one of them is dreams. And we have learned so far that he can uh, give dreams that protect your relationships and reveal when deception's taking place. We studied that uh, in the dream that uh, Abimelech had about Abraham and the deal with Abraham and saying Sarah was his sister and God told him no, it's, I told Abimelech no, it's his wife. Mm-hmm. And so that whole dream. And then we saw how that God spoke um, and to awaken through dreams to awaken destiny and connect you generationally and we talked about uh, Jacob and his experience where the angels were ascending and descending and God declared his destiny over him and uh, that this he he his father and his grandfather uh, Abraham and Isaac worshiped him and now he said I'm speaking to you Jacob and here's my plans for you and so God can speak to you in that way in a dream to make you aware of your destiny, what his plans and purposes are for. And then yesterday, lastly, uh, and there's a lot more to it than what I'm just briefly covering mm-hmm. here, but we talked about through dreams, there can be very specific directions and instructions given for your life. And we uh, gave examples of a number of dreams, particularly like Joseph and Mary and the Christ mm-hmm. child about uh, you need to flee to Egypt, mm-hmm. you need to leave Egypt, and you need to marry Mary. And uh, and there's other examples that we covered. But today, let's step into new territory as we talk about dreams. And that is that uh, sometimes, you know, God created family. Pastor Doc and I preached a message together on Sunday, and part of that was family is God's idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Holy Trinity models family, father and a son, both uh, related, and in the middle of that, the Holy Spirit. Um, so it, God cares about your family. God also cares about how you interact with your family. He cares about the husband-wife relationship, the parent-child relationship, and sometimes he will use dreams to um, to speak to what he's doing in the family and to let the family in on what he's doing. Mm-hmm. One example? Gen- <coughs> Excuse me, Genesis 37. Yes. Where Joseph uh, dreamed that his family would de- bow down before him. Uh, there was a dream about grain, a mm-hmm. dream about stars, and and then that dream would really be tested what he received in that dream and it would also be an anchor for him um, as he walked this out for many years realize and he, he kind of expected it to mm. i mean the scripture seems to indicate that joseph was excited about this revelation <laughs> and he was to sharing the good news with the rest of the family and they were not so much excited because in this dream he had about the stalks there was a sheaves one sheave rose up and stood up straight and tall, and the other sheeps bowed to that sheep. God was showing Joseph, I'm going to raise you up, and your family will actually bow before you. And then the other, the other was the sun, the moon, and the stars did obeisance. They bowed to Joseph. And so he's a young man. He's excited, like, wow, I'm going to be promoted over this family. I mean, and he, he, he shared it with his brothers. <laughs> 
And imagine how that would go in, if, you, if you had brothers and sisters. Oh, by the way, God told me that all you guys, uh, brothers and sisters, I'm not, I know I'm, you know, the, almost the youngest one here, but all of you are going to bow at my feet. God showed me. You can imagine how that went over like a lead balloon. As a matter of fact, it, it went over so well, his brothers conspired to kill him, took him out away from the farm, uh, threw him in a whale. And uh, we're going to leave him there to die. And then finally, the, the oldest one got some smarts and knew he would be the main one in trouble and said, look, look we'll just sell him into slavery because there was some uh, a band of slave traders that came by. They sold Joseph. And here he goes off to Egypt into slavery. And they uh, kill a goat and put the blood on Joseph's coat because dad had previously made Joseph a coat of many colors and created favoritism in the family and the brothers already had it in for Joseph and so when he starts talking about his God dreams and how he was going to be elevated over them Mm -hmm. uh, they just had all they could stomach uh, carnally speaking ended up selling him into slavery telling his father he was killed by a wild beast uh, or setting him up hey look we found this and what and his dad said oh he must have been killed by a wild beast and that was a family secret for years for years but what Joseph saw in that dream um, was the truth. It just wasn't, he, you know, if he had his dream on Tuesday night, he woke up on Wednesday morning thinking, well, I guess by sundown, my brothers and my parents are going to be bowing my feet. And he didn't realize it'd be about 20 years. About 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. So it was a good revelation. Why would God show this young man such a dream? Well, he was going to go through some really hard times. He was going to be in... Um, he was going to be a slave. He was going to be in prison. He was going to be forgotten. So many things that were going to happen. And, you know, he used that dream. And matter of fact, we can look at like Psalm 105. Yes. Verse 17 uh, says, He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass the word of the Lord tested him so there were some purposes in God giving him this he uh, had you know he had a real sense that it was a God moment a God encounter that God had a purpose for him Mm -hmm. a destiny for him and when everything that seemed exactly the opposite happened he still had this encounter with God to hold on to and uh, you know encourage him and you know, then when it all does eventually unfold, he's able to prophetically put the pieces of the puzzle together to understand that this yeah. has been God's plan. Uh, God had revealed this to him 20 years previously. Yeah. And when you said uh, just now about um, how Joseph uh, received this revelation, you know, and the trials and, and the testing, that. That's something we need to point out from this scripture mm-hmm. that's so true, and it's you find it in this mm-hmm. throughout the scripture, is when God, uh, when there's particularly like major revelation, mm-hmm. God begins to give you, that revelation is going to be tested. That word's going to be tested. Even Jesus, he was baptized, and uh, the Father spoke from heaven, said, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased." The next thing you see happening, he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. And how did the devil test him? If you are God's son, turn these stones into bread. If you be the son of God, cast yourself off here and these angels will bear you up. The quoted scripture, you know, the devil did. And But Jesus used the scripture legitimately as his weapon. The enemy was trying to use the scripture illegitimately to remove him from his destiny. So you, the, the words the Lord gives us will go through a testing. I love the scripture that Mickey just read out of Psalm 125. Did you notice what it said uh, when she read that? He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. God says, I was the one sending him out. But, but who sold him into slavery? His jealousy enraged brothers. So were they being led by the Holy Spirit and moved by the love of God saying, we're going to send you off to the mission field and you're going to be our savior in the future? No, they were going to kill him and decided on plan B just to get rid of him and sell him into slavery. But God looks at all that and said, I was sending him ahead of time. 
And so there, wow, there you get uh, another story where you have the sovereignty of God, God's big plan that he's overseeing and imperfect, even sin laden people who are doing things because of sinful reasons, sinful motives, jealousy, hatred, hostility. And yet God was working through that. And that's to the glory and majesty of God. Now, God did not cause those boys to do evil. God did not cause them to conspire to kill their brother nor sell him in slavery. But God knew uh, what his plan was for Joseph. And in, in these guys doing this, God just intervenes. I believe in that situation, the Lord probably moved on that oldest brother's heart and uh, to, uh, to say, let's, let's, not, let's just sell him into slavery. And God works in the middle of very imperfect situations. God can get right in the middle where a lot of sin is taking place. He is not causing any of it. He is not participating in any of it. He is not defiled by any of it. But in the midst of it, he can so govern that he works all things together for good to those who love him. He had an overarching purpose here. And and no power in hell was going to keep Joseph's word from coming true uh, other than maybe Joseph himself. And this said, the word of the Lord tested him until it came to pass. And this was just first base, wasn't it? His brothers throwing him in the pit and selling him into slavery. That's his first base. Then he goes to second base, Potiphar's house. What does God do? Favor him. What does Potiphar do? Promote him. Everything's going good. Even as a slave, he's got God's blessing on his life. And then one day Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. And Joseph refused her advances, and then she she pray, she played the card against him and said, rape, rape, he tried to rape me. See, here's his coat. And Joseph gets thrown into prison. Those coats cost you a lot of <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. If I see him, I think I'd just stay away from a coat, you know. <laughs> I never thought about that, but that's true. And so he ends up in prison. Guess what happens to him? God favors him. He gets promoted. Here is a young man uh, betrayed by his brothers, falsely accused of rape in prison. And now, because of God's favor, he's in the middle of this, you don't see him becoming bitter. You know, when Potiphar's wife was coming out, he said, well, look what I've gone through. Maybe I should have something for myself. Why not? She's a beautiful woman. Why not? He didn't do that. He remained pure. And it cost him, again, he goes to prison, God favors him, and then what happens? They turn the whole penal, the penal system over to Joseph. It's just amazing how, because he was being tested by this word and continued to be true to the word, that favor was on him, opening doors. God was kept opening doors, even though man was trying, to, and the devil was trying to do him in, destroy him. Uh, thrown in a pit, God gets him out and gives him to this group of slave traders. Uh, sold to Potiphar, God raises him up. Accused, gone to prison, God raises him up. And now he's forgotten in prison. Uh, he, um, uh, he had a dream. He was a dreamer. But now in prison, there's some other guys having dreams. You remember the story of Pharaoh's butler and baker? Mm-hmm. They get thrown in prison because there was some brouhaha that one of them or both of them had conspired to, this is kind of reading between the lines, to take Pharaoh out. That's the way it was in that day. You could poison a Pharaoh king so people that cooked food and served wine, they had to pass the test. They had to have high level security clearance, okay? So now those guys are thrown in prison. They're just trying to investigate and find out what's going on. And they have dreams. They find out, oh, here's a young man that can interpret dreams. So apparently, that tells us another thing about Joseph, that his ministry, his ability, his prophetic gifting, he's still using that. How would they have known that if he had not been helping people in some way? I think you also see that Joseph didn't turn his back on that prophetic gifting, even though he has this dream and yeah. he shares This just gets he, me in trouble. And he winds yeah. up everything seemingly but the opposite happening he still ha- held on to his faith in god and his faith in dreams and um 
So he hadn't become bitter. You could see that he is willing to interpret their dreams. He has an understanding yeah. of it, and God uses that. So it's interesting to think how he is still, you know, maybe holding on to that dream from the past that dreams are real, and God, yeah. God, God can speak to me in a dream. And he believed mm. God was speaking in dreams there. And the enemy can work through carnal people to bring the hammer of circumstance against your mm-hmm. life, to separate you from the revelation God has given you to guide your life. And we need to understand that. That revelation was his brothers would bow down before him. And now, to start with, he's in the bottom of a pit, as low as you can get, looking up. And guess who's up there? The faces of his brothers looking down in the hole at him. His dream was they would be at his feet looking up at him. Now he's in the bottom of the hole looking up at them. That's the testing of that word when circumstances say the exact opposite to what God has said. Will you still believe what God has said? And it's easy to say, oh, yes, bless God, I'm going to believe him no matter what. But when you're in the bottom of the hole and it's upside down from what God said, that's difficult, but yet his faith endured. And like you said, we obviously he still hangs on to that. He's still uh, using that gifting. So back to the butler and baker in prison. Uh, they share the dreams. Uh, the, the butler had a dream, you know, that I'm in the vineyard and I'm pressing wine and I serve uh, something, let's say, like three, three something. And, and he serves it to Pharaoh. And then the baker said, I, I, I had... Uh, like uh, three loaves of head on my uh, bread on my head, and then the birds came and ate it. And Joseph said, "This is the interpretation. In three days, the butler, you will be restored to serve Pharaoh again. And and, and then three days, uh, Mr. Baker, uh, you're going to be executed. And that's exactly how it happened. Um, and then he was forgotten mm-hmm. until another someone had a big dream, had two of them." Yes. Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt. It's amazing how dreams are involved in Joseph's life in powerful ways. His initial dreams of the of the, bar, the barley, the the shafts mm-hmm. of wheat, and the sun, moon, stars, stars. Mm-hmm. and then the butler and baker dreams, and now Pharaoh's mm-hmm. dreams. It's like this um, again. If that's his area of gifting, God's going to use that to open the doors. And the enemy's going to come against it to shut that down. And I've I've ministered, as you have too, through the years, a lot of people that maybe started operating the prophetic and then literally all hell broke loose. And it's like, man, if this is what it brings me, I'm I'm going to back off. Well, that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to come hard against you. And particularly, I think, children that are uh, maybe prophetically inclined, the enemy really wants to... I've ministered to so many families and their children having trouble to sleep at night and, and the family would say, you know, our child is like they've had a dream or they've seen a vision and but the enemy wants to get in there and pollute that and put a lot of fear in it and back them off of it. Absolutely. And Joseph's destiny, if we want to go back to what that word was, you know, it really had to do with the entire nation of Israel. He sent Joseph before them not only to save them, but to save the entire nation. So yesterday we said we were going to mention how God works in nations. And so he had a purpose for Israel. He's going before, uh, you know, and blessed Joseph in Egypt and who gives him all this wisdom. And I think Joseph learned wisdom. We might say that it might not have been a lot of wisdom when he... Uh, told his brothers his dream right off the bat. But through the years, obviously he developed a lot of wisdom and God used him Mm -hmm. to spare uh, Egypt and Israel. That's so good because you see this maturation process of Joseph. When he gets his first dream, he blabs it out to his brothers and and probably uh, before the day was over when he's in the hole, he was thinking, I might have just held on to that myself for a while, you know. And But at the end of the story, when his brother shows up, instead of just racing and revealing himself, you see this process, patience struggling of it. just allowing. And basically, he partnered with God so God could do a deep work in his, in his, whole, in his brother's lives. And you see that. And so that at the end, he's reconciled to his brothers. But for all that to happen, Pharaoh had to have a dream. And uh, 
You know, people can say what they want to, but it just seems to me that God gave Pharaoh his dreams. Yes. Because you, you mentioned how mm-hmm. Joseph, that someone will probably went before them, you know, to save the nation of Israel. But it also saved the nation of, of Egypt. Indeed. It also saved other nations. There's a sense uh, in the known world of that day that the singular dream that God allowed Joseph to interpret became a key to open up uh, preservation of life among the nations and also uh, the the singular dream that God gave Joseph early in life is what kept him and put him on the path to be in the position to interpret the singular dream mm-hmm. well, actually Pharaoh had two dreams but I'm talking about a singular experience around two dreams to um, to to turn Pharaoh's heart toward Joseph and yeah. he's, you know, and so this is really beautiful. Let's talk about Pharaoh's dream a little bit. Because um, it's kind of like in Daniel's day, you know, when he had to interpret a dream and uh, wasn't even told the dream. But uh, <laughs> that's, 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 that that's, that's, a, that, that's a whole, 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 a whole another uh, level of the prophetic. But Pharaoh has actually has uh, two different dreams, as, as I remember it. And uh, the first he has a dream, he sees seven fat cows coming up out of the river and then followed by seven skinny cows. And then he had um, uh, another dream, and I'm trying to remember, if I don't think I I wrote that down, but there's another dream similarly uh, where the seven and the seven, uh, oh, I think it's just like the seven uh, uh, bushel harvest and that that was big and then that that was not. And the message was Joseph was able to interpret it. Well, how did Pharaoh know about Joseph? Well, the butler. Who was supposed to remember who Joseph. Joseph had revealed to him what God was up to. He remembered how Joseph had helped him with a dream. And then he brings it to the attention of the Pharaoh. Joseph is brought before him. He interprets Pharaoh's dream, says, The Lord is telling you there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And then he tells him what he needs to do. And Pharaoh is so moved upon that there on the spot, he makes Joseph the second in command over the entire nation of Egypt. He went from the pit to Potiphar's house from Potiphar's house to prison, from prison to the palace of Pharaoh. He went from being a young man betrayed by his brothers to be the, being the second governmental, in, the second most influential governmental official in all of Egypt with a history of administration. Just think about how God used his difficulty that like you see the enemy at work trying to push Joseph away from his destiny so he ends up in prison. Well, he learns to administrate an entire prison system. In Potiphar's house, a very wealthy man, he learns to administrate his finances. You know, all of that. And so by the time he stands before Pharaoh, he's got all this OJT, on-the-job experience, brought about by difficult circumstances. And uh, even in being falsely accused, he, he kept his tongue, you know, he, he, learned, he learned how to be self-controlled, he learned how to be patient, he learned how to be administrative, he learned all this. So by the time it, that word needed to come to fulfillment, he had a lot of practical experience, he had a lot of spiritual growth, and he was the man ready for the job because God had prepared him. That's what that Psalm 105, read that again, Psalm 105, 17 and following. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And I think a lot of times for we can look back in our lives and see how the circumstances, the places, experiences, the jobs, the different um, rocks, so to speak, uh, along the path, how those have prepared us for where God brings us. So sometimes we can't see that until way down the road, Mm -hmm. how he's fitting all that together. And for Joseph, it had a huge impact on nations. 
It really did. Today, we've seen just in this one life story of Joseph, and I mean, you could do a whole series on Joseph. There's, there's some deep wells in the life of Joseph to study. And particularly, I would encourage anyone that feels a calling into the marketplace arena. Mm-hmm. And there's so many good lessons in the study of the life of Joseph about how God prepares us in the ups and downs. Mm-hmm. And and with the rejections we go through and the trials we face, the word of the Lord tested him. And what we often don't realize is when we're being tested, that in itself is uh, God's school of hard knocks. It's a, it's a school of preparation. It's a school where we're being disciplined, where we're being trained. It's refined. It's nothing's wasted when you put it in God's hands. And so we see Joseph being the kind of man when when it was up, when it was down, when it was good, bad, or ugly. You've seen, and I'm not saying he didn't have difficult days, and there wasn't days that he might not have missed it a little here and there. All of us do that. But by and large, he was still just keeping it in God's hand. Lord, I don't know how this is working, but I know what you told me, and I'm hanging on to that. And just keep putting it in God's hands, even the difficult times, the days that you fail, the the mistakes that you make, the confusing times when it looks like God's nowhere to be found and the devil's everywhere you look. You know, all those kind of seasons, if you just trust God and keep putting it in his hands, you can trust that that is not going to be wasted, that you'll find out in your life that even that was a time of preparation because he truly can work all things together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. His purpose. Those that love him and those who love him, if we have a disposition of, God, I love you and I'm going to trust you, he's going to keep working things together toward his purposes. And it ended well for Joseph. It ended and, well. And because... It ended well for his family because of his journey. The obedience of one man... Uh, gave the sustaining of life to entire nations. In that sense, he's a picture of Christ. Yes. How his obedience led to the blessing of so many. And, and God used um, Joseph, who was one of the sons of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. He used Joseph to maintain and keep those covenant promises he had made to Abraham to Isaac and Jacob to a great, great, great grandson and a great grandson and a grandson. So dreaming. So we saw today that um, just to, so to keep people up here, that how it, dreams can affect family dynamics and promotion in our life. We saw how uh, dreams can prophetically reveal decisions mm-hmm. and outcomes, like those dreams with the butler and the mm-hmm. baker. And we saw how dreams can change nations and open doors of destiny. It's this dream that uh, that Joseph had and, fa- and dreams that Pharaoh had. So you might want to go back and read those dreams in the yeah. book of Genesis. and, and uh, We didn't take time a- to read all those because of time. Mm-hmm. But, but it'd be good to do so. To, uh, invite the Lord to speak to you through dreams and learn uh, about that. And there's a lot to learn. It's wonderful. And we will continue tomorrow. Yes, I'm, I think tomorrow we may look at a very intriguing dream. It had to do with a man's wife who had a dream. And her dream um, would greatly impact the life or death situation uh, in the life of a very, very important person we all know and love in Scripture. Hmm. I'm baited to hook a little bit for you there. So see you tomorrow. Amen. God bless you, and we love you.